So do you want me just to share the screen and carry yeah, on? Feel, feel free okay, to do that. Let's, let's see if we can do that. Uh, share. Fantastic. Getting there. Are we there? We yeah. are there. Brilliant. Right. Mark, you're set as the host now, by the way. Thank you very much. Well, let me um let me just introduce Dick. If you haven't met Dick, Dick is going to be talking to this evening about control line open speed and getting started in it, which is um going to be quite exciting, I would hope. And um he'll remind us whether it's clockwise or anti-clockwise later, I'm sure. Um and uh, and the other thing as well, just to let everybody know, if you're going to make any comments, please, can you put them in the Q&A box? Um, obviously, feel free to have a bit of a chat, but we don't always pick up on those. So the question and answers in the Q&A box and we will get round to answering every one of them um, throughout the evening. Dick, I'm going to leave it in yours and, and some of Barry's hands, I think, here to um, yes. take us through it. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, and good evening, everybody. I think I noticed that we got people from pretty much all over the globe. We got from the US and South Africa, Switzerland, um, as well as the UK. Of course, we're going to focus mostly on uh, open speed flying in the UK and getting started in that. But, you know, um, hopefully it relates to all over. So, who is helping you out this evening? Barry, Barry Lever, longtime pylon racer and control line speed flyer extraordinaire. Is there on the left? Say hi, Barry. Evening all. Oh, okay. And then myself. Um, I've been a speed flyer for a while, mostly been flying pulse jet. Hopefully, learned from some of the best, and you can see. One of the best there holding me up. So I think that's Whittier Narrows. That's uh, Big Joe Matheson. Okay, so we're going to talk about getting started in control line open speed, which is, you know, the open classes that we have in the UK. Um, and we're going to really talk mostly about 12, 21N, F29, and um, sport jet. So we'll talk a little bit about Barton Club Speed and we'll also just mention what's going on at CMBL and hopefully some of the CMBL guys are on this evening. And we'll, we'll try and go through the setups, where you can find parts, where you can fly in the UK and how to get the support you might need. And then we'll, we'll go into Q&A. I, I mean, I think we'll get the most value out of the questions and answers rather than you just listening to me and Barry drone on. Anything you want to add there, Barry? No, not at the moment. I, I think the question and answers, that's where we'll, like you say, uh, where we'll get the real value into this. Okay. Okay, folks. So in the UK, we have some open speed classes and probably... You know, the, some of them are quite similar to classes elsewhere in the world. But the ones we're going to focus on are 12, uh, 21N, F29, and Sport Jet. And at the uh, British Nationals this year, we did make some important changes to some of these classes to, to help people get into open speed and just talking about 12 if we look at that you can see that we we've actually increased the line length a bit uh that's actually the old f2a line length so that's 10 laps to the kilometer and we actually increased the minimum weight of the model to 500 grams and the reason we did that is because it's it's about the same weight as a F2A model, which means that you could, you know, get hold of an old F2A model and chop it about a bit and hopefully get a 12 model to, to run that way. That's why we did that. 21N, we increased the line length to 17.69, 
which is, as you can see, just the, the, the current regular F2A line size, that's nine laps to the kilometre. Uh, and that, again, it just helps with the rotational speed. Um, you know, anybody that remember Dave Smith flying F21, even on 17.69, can remember that it gets quite frantic. F29 was already set up pretty well. As you can see, it's on the 19.9 meter line length. Those guys in the US, that's 65 feet and change. Similarly for sport jet, it's 65 feet. Or they are in, in the US, it's, um, I think that's Northwest sport jet line length 19.965 feet they're all two line they're all two line events so that's really the the point of this slide was just to show you how they relate to all the other classes that we fly anything to add there barry it was all it was all work that we done to try and help newcomers coming in really moving the 21 N up to 17.69 and likewise the 12 up to 15.92. That's right. Okay. So let's have a look at other British speed classes. So at Barton, well, before we talk about that, we should talk about nostalgic speed. So uh, Tony Goodger and his crew run nostalgic speed and it includes weatherman speed which is, which is quite popular it's for, the, for the guys in the States. It's a bit like turkey speed, except there are a lot of different classes everywhere from, I can't remember whether it's 049, but anyway, it goes all the way up to 10cc. And there, and the, the, there are a number of different sizes. Uh, it's quite popular, but I'm, I'm just not competent to talk about it. But if you're interested in that, you can contact Tony Goodger, who may be on this evening so he may he may be able to say something during Q and A later. Oh, Tony is on the is listening in, and we'll okay, great. We'll pull okay, him well, in later. Gird up your loins, Tony. For questions on weatherman. Um, Barton Club Speed runs at Barton, and you can see a couple of uh, Barton Club Speed models there. Um, Malcolm Ross has got quite a nice little rendition of a pink lady. Uh, but they're all one and a half cc plane bearing, so they're mostly diesels. Although we do run, some guys do run Cox 09 glows. Um, their hand launch, 13 and a half meters, and it's on a personal best basis. So what that means is you, at every event, you have three goes, and we keep a track of your best speed. And the idea is to try and improve your technique and your speed over the season. So, I mean, it's quite popular. We get, I guess, the most number of entries we've had in the last year or so, was about 16 or 17, I think. So, I mean, it's quite popular. Anything to add, Barry? I'm just uh, replying to someone about monoline and fast jets. All right. Carry on. Yeah. So... The other thing that we've noticed, it because um, uh, Jean-Paul Pre put it on to uh, the, uh, the Facebook page that we have, is that CMBL, so that's, uh, I can't remember exactly what that stands for, but it's the, it's the team, it's the club in Londres in France, have an F2A trainer initiative going at their club. And they've made some kits, and uh, one of their youngsters, a guy called Lohan, has put this model together, which looks pretty handy to me as um, you know a model to get started in in uh, to speak, well, well speed flying generally. I mean, if you want more information on that, they do have CMBL do have a Facebook page. And it's all on there. But, you know, they're to be congratulated for that. So let's talk about 12. As I said, the line length is the old F2A line length. 
and we limited the fuel to commercially available fuel, which in this country means that the max nitro would be 25%. Um, so finding an engine can be tricky, but it, it's not so tricky. There are, there are um, car engines. It's mostly car engines. There are a lot of car engines about. And this little engine here is a car engine that I, I, I modified just to show that it could be done. And that model on the left is an old Mejlik uh, F2A model. It's one that my son Matthew actually uh, used in his first years competing in F2A. And if we look at the next slide, you can see uh, the top left-hand side is the inside of that model. You can see how the tank's fitted. And it's not easy, I have to say, it would not be easy to get that particular 12 model, 12 engine in there. They're, they're shorter than the 15s for a start. But it, it may be possible. And the pan there is just a, an F2A pan. It's probably an old style F2A pan. I think the newer pans are probably slightly different, but not much. Um, and the engine, again, is just another view of that OS-12 engine that I modified. In the middle, you can see I had to, I, I cut the head down. I took the, uh, it was a pull starter on the back. I took that off and I ground the little peg off the crank pin and I made a back plate and put a pressure nipple in it. I've still got to uh, put a dump tube in the, in the fuel intake. You can see I haven't fitted that yet, but I've done it to some, some 21, so I know I can do it. But that's the sort of involvement. If you want to fly a 12 that looks like that, and this is Chris Martindale's model. And this, this is a car engine and it's got the, the um, Super Sport silencer on it. Um, and the reason we run the silence is not just to cut down the noise, but it does make the, model, the engine slightly easier to tune. So that's quite helpful. With Chris is still sorting this model out. I think he's had, he had tank issues last time we tried to fly it, but it's a dinky little thing and it looks like it should go. But the other, you know, the other side to this is that, you know, if you wanted to build a profile model like the CMBL model, these things would be eminently suitable for that too. Um, and would be great just to get going. And there are, there are a lot of, 12 car engines about, and they're not a lot of money. So, you know, getting started would be quite good. Dick, um, a couple of couple of things there. Yeah. Um, go If you could go back to the engine picture, if, if you can, don't, don't be put off by the single bladed propeller. We talked about this um, when the rules were being done and Peter quite, Peter Holman quite rightly pointed out that, um, you know, a, a single blade propeller, you will not go through as many propellers. You know, we, I said, well, that might put people off. And he said, no, no, once it's, once you've got the single blade propeller sorted out, you, you, you won't be break, breaking them like you would uh, a two blade propeller, much more chance of breaking a two blade propeller. And the second thing is he's shared with us um, quite a nice spreadsheet for calculating if, for making the super silencers. So we've got that information available should anyone want to um, have that, they can contact you or I afterwards. Okay, I mean, I, th I think I've got that spreadsheet on the slide a bit further down. Uh, no, it's a, it's actually a proper Excel sheet. That, that oh, one. right. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a really nice one. Okay, well, that's good. I, I haven't got that, so we'll have to contact you for that. Okay, so moving right along, this is a tatty old 21N model that um, I flew yonks ago. And I mean, I mean, it's got a pan, you can see, 
uh, and a super silencer. And the engine is actually an OS Marine engine, which we just kind of trimmed down, obviously, to the flywheel off. So that, um, but it flies pretty well. I mean, you know, both the 12 and the 21, as they're shown, obviously take off out of a dolly. So it, it teaches you how to get out of, off the ground out of a dolly too, which is quite a handy skill to have. Um, this is a, these are a couple of other 21N engines, car engines that have been modified. Uh, the OS Max 21 VG I got off eBay for not much money. Uh, and it was pretty easy to modify. It did not have a full style. The Force engine, which is the lower right, is even less money brand new in this country. Um, and it, come, it can come without a full style. Or even if it does come with a pull start, this engine does not have a peg on the crankshaft. So you can pull the uh, pull start right out the back of the model and of the engine and either fit the spare part regular back plate or make your own. So, you know, you can get an engine to run for not much money, which is quite good for getting started. Um, anything to add, Barry? Um, no, just that the, there's just so many 21 engines out there that are cheaply available. There really is no no reason not not to um, have a go. There's just loads yeah, of them I, around. You know, the, the, the big issue these days with, with speed flying generally or, or, or any of the speed flying for non-F2A or jet models is getting hold of pans. And we can talk about that a bit more later. But, but certainly 12 and 21, we think, personally, I think it would lend itself to a, a profile style like the CMBL model, maybe a little bit more developed, which would easily get you going and at least get you feeling what a competition is like, which is, you know, where you need to start, really. You need to get used to flying in the pylon and taking off and, and getting your laps in and so on. Dick, can I interrupt a second? Uh, question just from Matt Hurst. He's put it in the chat, but I think it's quite, an, quite a poignant one. Any specific limit to what 21s can be used? Uh, no. So long as it's a 21, you can use it, but you're not going to be able to put a tuned pipe on it. We... we use super silencers on the 21 ends. So I don't know, Barry, but some of the, some of the piped 21s, maybe the, um, the timing might be a bit high for a super silencer. I'm not really sure. The, um, some of the 21s, like the OS and the Nova Rossi's, they're up in the sort of 170s, high 170s on the timing. Might be a, might be a little bit much for a super silencer but i think it's just a case of getting the getting it propped propped right yeah. i think the um the force was a bit lower a bit lower timing the one that you showed there yeah it's the one that's on there now i did i did run them all somewhere here so this is another view of the uh, of the uh, 21 model uh it's pretty simple as you can see uh, we I just um, stuck the uh, tank into the pan with some silicone just so that there's no vibration and the, and the super silencer just fits on behind and you can see where I had to solder up the tank it vibrate and it runs on pressure it does not run on pipe pressure it runs on crankcase pressure and a, a pretty solid performance. So long ago since we flew it, I've no, I've no idea how fast it went. Is there a specific fuel, Dick? There is no limit on the fuel for 21. Um, I need to check that, but I think that's right. It's only, it's only 12 that's limited to uh, commercially available fuel. But it, 
but in fact, um, yeah, I'm just checking the just checking the rules. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. But when when I when I ran the twenty ones, you it's quite interesting. You'll see something here in a second. And this, um, so Peter, who who made this one, Barry? That's a Joe Harvey. Peter Joe Harvey made Peter that. Joe uh, Harvey. Yeah. Yeah. So they. They're building a 21 at the moment and they haven't got a pan. So they thought they'd have a go at a panless model. Um, and that's that's a mock-up so far of what you can see. But again, I, I think the sidewinder profile approach would suit this. This particular, yeah. this particular super silencer, I, I think, is a bit on the long side. Uh, but it, it was just built that way because you, the the adapter that goes onto the engine can come off, so you can chop it back till you get the right speed. And there is a maximum length. We do specify a maximum length. Yes, two hundred and forty. Yeah. So that, but it just shows you what's possible. And he three D printed that uh, Venturi as well, which was quite interesting. That oh, black right. pen. Yeah, that was three D printed. Yes, that, that's pretty good. Yeah. So and that'll hold up. That'll hold up to the heat in there. Yeah. This this is the, <clears throat> you know th this information is available on our on our uh, website. Um, uh, and this is, these are the nominal dimensions for twenty one N super silencers. I won't go into the detail, but you can see how they're made, and they're pretty easy to make. To be honest, Barry and I can make them. Anybody can make. Them. Okay. Website. Your website. Didn't we, didn't we put it on oh, the website? To the, um, to the speed website where that, that other information is hosted. Okay. So I did run this summer, I did run some of the engines that I modified. So it was just out of interest, I put this here. All of the pressure nipples, they were all run on crankcase pressure with a one millimeter bore on the pressure nipple and the dump tube which is the tube that was feeding the fuel into the intake, is one and a half meter bore. And I tried 25% nitro first because everybody's saying that these engines are all set up for that. And everything that I tried blew plugs, just blew the plugs instantly. And uh, so I made up some 10% fuel. And Again, as you can see, I had to come down to the APC 6.5 by 5 to, to get the, the, the revs where they ought to be. And you can see what the pickup was. You know, we went, we went from like 19.9 to 24 and a half, and 22 and a half to 27 and a half. The force engines, I did, I did two, I did one force engine and the other force engine. Chris Martindale did, and they both ran exactly the same speed, even though they look slightly different internally. They ran 24 and a half. And these are all brand new. Well, the force engines were brand new. I didn't run them in or anything. I just bolted them down and gave it to them. And the OS 21RX, which is the older one in the yellow model, was the fastest engineer. It did 27,000 and changed. And the, and the old Urban 20, which is an old pylon race engine, and I don't even know how old it is, did 25,000 RPM, so it must be well running. <laughs> and it, even on the 10%, we were blowing plugs. So I'm, I'm guessing that we need to do something with the head clearance in, in order to, to solve that. And I ran all of that open face. Um, so just gives you a feel for, for the respective power of the engines. That's the whole point of putting that on there. F29, we'll nip through this pretty quick. So this um, model is being modeled by Nelly, who is, who is Barry's granddaughter. And John Newton put this engine, put this model together for me. 
It actually uses an F2A uh, bell crank. Um, and the engine, again, is a car engine. Um, so here are some pictures of, of it's, a, it's a Rex engine, a Rex 28. And we were just running an APC propeller. Um, oh, it's all pictures of it. Uh, haven't really rung it out yet. The tank feeds well. Tank's feeding quite nicely. The engine starts easily. It's easy to set. And the model flies well. Um, it obviously pulls a little bit more than the others, but it, it's not untoward. I think that's about it, isn't it, Barry? I was just um, typing some answers. Dick, they were coming in thick and fast. Okay, I'll I'll press on because I want to get to the Q and A so that we can talk about that. So, sport jet. You know, if you want to get started in sport jet. Again, it's 60, for us here, we use the 65 foot lines, which is the same as uh, US Northwest region, regional sport jet. Um, and we run 80% methanol, 20% nitromethane. Does he, you either go with upright, so the upright models tend to protect the engine a bit better, and the sidewinder models, to be honest, fly better. They're much easier to fly. And so this is the general setup for the sport jet, um, two line model. And the, the thing about sport jet is very, very competitive because all the, end, all the models fly within about 10 mile an hour of each other, Barry, somewhere there. Oh yes, yeah. And it depends Most on the day. So, so you can have quite a good bit of competition. Most of the most of the meetings, the majority of the people are plus 140, 142, 143. The fast guys like yourself and Ken are 148, 149. The records are 150.1. So it's yeah. all pretty pretty close. That that's in this country. So in yeah. the US, they they go a bit quicker. Well, they go a bit quicker. They're flying on slightly shorter lines. Yeah. And probably have a bit better weather. The weather with us has been a bit strange this year. But anyway, uh, it's a good, you know, it's a good class. Yes, they pull, but they don't pull hugely. You know, I mean, it's if you've flown a, a Barton B model, all you've got to do is learn to fly a Barton B model in the pylon and you track it, really. And they don't fly forever. They're only going to fly for about 20 seconds. Um, there's another shot. This, this is just one of the early uh, uprights. Actually, it's the first, up, first sport jet that I built. Uh, I mean, it looks a bit tatty. But my son, Matthew, I think, came third at the US Nationals one year with that model. So just a word... Generally speaking, about you know when you're getting started and you're thinking about doing this, the control line wire and the bell cranks are a key part of the safety of flying. And particularly at Barton, we're we're very careful about how we fly. Our neighbours are the police helicopter guys, and they're within a hundred yards or so of our main circle because we fly up the end of an, of an active aerodrome. So in the UK, the flying lines that we, we use are all high tensile carbon steel wire to ASTM A228, and the equivalent BS is 5216, and I do not know the uh, ISO that relates to that. It'd be easy to spot against ASTM A228. And the, and the way we make it off is fairly particular to us too. They're all bound and soldered, but not all the way to each end. And we use generally epoxy at the very ends just to um, make sure we haven't got a rigid connection or at least a, red, a rigid transition 
from the bound part to the non-bound part. And as you can see, we do use rotating buttons wherever we can. That's a sport jet a bell crank on the right uh, and an F2A bell crank on the left. And you can see the, the F2A bell crank has some little rotating buttons fitted. And that will make all the difference. You know, what we, if the, what we found is that the, the loop, the single loop, you know, it, if there's a lot of vibration, it, it can fail. And this, this will help to avoid that. So that's the reason that's in there. Uh, for those of you that are interested, these are the provisional contest calendar dates running from April through to October. They're not fully nailed down yet, but the point about this is that where to fly. For the most part, if you want to come along and get involved, there are two locations. There's Barton near Manchester, which is where we mostly fly. And then there's Buckminster, which is the new uh, BMFA flying center. Uh, at Buckminster, you will not be able to fly sport jet. You will be able to fly up to 21, right? Yeah. Um, so all classes up to, up to and including 21, all classes above 21. We can't fly at Buckminster, so you have to come to Barton or any other of the, of the national championships. Um, or to Croydon. Or Croydon. Right. Yeah. So that's that's just that's really particular to the UK. Um, parts finders. So okay, where can you get the bits to to get involved? So one of the websites. Well, you can get a lot of stuff, although it is it is very much geared towards the F2 classes, is, is F2 ABCD. And in the UK, Mark Greenwood is, is the, the guy. He's the main contact for all that. So I've put his contact details there on the online store website. So as we discussed before, some of those parts may also be suitable for 12, 21, and, and F29. So just because they're for F2A doesn't mean to say that they may not work for the other stuff. And they, and they sell all kinds of bits, including props. Uh, and, you know, as you maybe noticed, the, mono, the uh, single blader that was on the 12 is actually just a cut down F2A propeller. The North American Speed Society Parts Finder is also very useful. Um, if you can go on their website and, and in the public, their parts finder is on the public page. So there are a number in the US of, of folks that, that make parts, and I, but I'm a bit out of touch, but I do know that uh, uh, the prop, the Eichenberger props. I'm pretty sure that Steve Eichenberger is still making props. I know that still Steve Wilk will still make props. Um, I did speak to John Newton about six months ago, as far as I know, and he said he was still he would still make build models. Uh, although I, don't, I haven't checked that recently. Um, and of course, there's Bill Hughes. So Bill says he has dark speed pans, and I've never phoned him up to ask him what he's, what he's got, but he may well still have some dark pans. So that's always handy. And then for, for sport jet stuff, um, you know, we, Barry and I have, you know, do our best to supply stuff for that. But Barry has also made glass fuselages for Weatherman class six and seven. Um, yes, they, Jim Hammond in Taiwan um, done all the tooling for that deck. And then um, right. we've got that tooling over here, like you say, for class six and, and class seven. And I should think we'll see some of those out 
early next year. I hope so. Yeah. Also, on the propeller side of things, on the Control Line Speed website, which we linked earlier, um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, we certainly linked it earlier. The very comprehensive article on making propellers, making the propeller tools and moulding the propellers. Okay, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm rushing a little bit here because I want to get to Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mark, do you want to lead us with some of these Q&As? And I, I will happily do that. I think Barry should start with a few because he's been answering a few by pen, by uh, by typing. Is there yeah. any Barry you want to bring to the rest of the audience? Because obviously some of these have probably been missed. For uh, sure, yeah. Um, Peter Fox um, reminded us that you that we can fly up to sixty size Weatherman at Buckminster uh, because the Weathermans fly on a shorter line length than the sixty um, open speed models. I think they go eighteen point six nine. I think it might be. Whereas the um, open speed 60s fly on 19.9s um so yeah weathermans can fly at um buckminster is, is tony is, can you again bring tony goodger in maybe yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's just warn tony i'm gonna click allow to talk for tony so tony if you um uh can unclick your yep there you go you've done it Worthy. Yeah, good evening, Tony. Yeah, but we, we've got you just on audio. Would you like to say something about Weatherman, please? Yeah, we um, Weatherman, I've always thought as a bit of an entry class to speed. The model flies very well, very simple to build, no issues with pans and the like. Um, and we have classes going from 1cc right through to 10cc, so there's plenty of scope there. Um, the difference from the open speed class is we insist on suction feed and an open exhaust, which makes things a lot easier in certain respects. Um, and it also makes older engines more competitive. Um, some, of the, some of the guys are using quite old engines, back 70s and 80s engines, and very competitive with them. And they're nice and cheap to buy on eBay. Um, for those that are interested in more information i did do quite a long article in the sam 35 year book a couple of years ago so there's quite a lot of information on all aspects of weatherman um if somebody really wanted i can always email them a copy of it if that would help that's great thanks tony yeah thanks tony and if anybody wants that email i think if you get in touch with barry or all the guys on the website yeah, yeah. they'll they'll ping that through to you um yeah Sure. Question here from John Kirkham while we've been uh, been listening to that. How do you balance a single bladed prop? Same way as it's a two bladed prop. Yeah. On a on a prop balancer, no, that's facetious. I mean, the the perfectionists will make a little uh, mandrel which which replic in, in alloy which replicates the prop shaft. And you assemble the the back plate, the prop, and the um, spinner cone, but not not obviously the nut, onto your uh, balancer, and you balance the whole thing as an entity. And it looks really weird when you when you're balancing them when you flick them on the balancer. Yeah, but the, but it's the brass counterweight. You can see the brass counterweight. On that, and he, you just grind away at the brass counterweight until you get it in balance. And if you overdo it, then you have to unglue it from the brass counterweight, make a new brass counterweight, and start again. Or a lie, you just put some solder on it. I guess that the, the trick of that, the one thing that I would never have thought about was the uh, was the cone at the front. Yeah, because that itself is yeah. No, I get that. Okay, we've got a few other questions coming in. John Kirk and we've answered. Anthony Clipstone, um, what air source do you use to start the pulse jets? We Dick brings along a really nice um, uh, compressor with a, a Honda uh, engine driving it. Um, 
and that's you know, that's really really reliable. You can use um, uh, diving bottles, and also we've got a couple of small um, twelve and twenty four volt compressors that run off of LiPo batteries. So we. Can, but you can, I mean, you can start the sport jets with with a with a stirrup pump. Stirrup well. pump, yeah. There's, you know, there's a kind of a school of thought. Billington said that he thought maybe they started quite well on stirrup pumps because you get a quite a long, you get a, a wide range of pressure. Um, so somewhere in that range of pressure is the right yeah. pressure for starting. I mean, I think you know, if the weather conditions are right, they'll they'll start right up anyway. It's at least I'm on a stirrup pump. And we've also started them. I haven't seen them so much in this country, but quite a lot. Uh, I've started a lot of times with Joey, and it's just an air tank. And we, we pump the air tank up to about 90 PSI or so with, a, with one of these tyre inflators, you know, a car tyre inflator off the battery, car battery. And that... And that'll run, for that, you know, you can start a few pulse jets with that, fast jets and sport jets. So there's a whole range of things that you can, oh, and, well, I haven't, I've done it with a big RC type sport jet, but I have not, I have to admit, I've yet to try it on these small ones. You can start them with a leaf blower. So there's a... Silence, I don't know, is that, yeah. Yeah. So then we've, we've got um, Tony's asked about pipe pressure with super silencers. I've used a lot of super silencers on 21s, and yes, we did use pipe pressure, but you could also be using crankcase pressure, I think, Dick, couldn't you? I believe so. Yeah. So then Gary Peacock has said, are the long single wings moulded in carbon? Uh, some, of the, some of the best ones are, but Generally, they're folded from uh, 10 foul uh, dual aluminium. Um, you literally kind of fold it back on itself. Um, we can probably, there are some good articles about that. We'll, we'll dig those out and get them up on the, um, on the website. Yeah, Matt Hurst asks, are there any ready to fly lines available for entry, entry level classes? This has always seemed like a barrier to entry level in CL in general. No, we sell lines. Um, we sell lines, but not made up lines. But someone could, um, someone we, we could sort of talk about making up lines off, off making making up the lines off line. I think it would be quite a difficult thing to talk about right at the moment yeah i mean you know we do have supplies of wire very good supplies of wire so, yeah okay. making a set of high tensile carbon steel wire making yeah. a set for your model is a particular thing because you need your model and you need your handle if you want to get the line length right you know yes on um uh, Dick, do you do you want to talk about flying from the pylon? Joe Brownlee from USA, he's asked about. Please discuss flying from the pylon techniques. Well, well, I will. But Joe Brownlee knows how to fly from. The <laughs> Say, I, I think he <laughs> spent a lifetime flying. From I think the he's pylon. expanding. Yeah, expanding <laughs> the conversation. Okay, so. So generally speaking, and and I mean I, I mean I've flown in the pylon, but not as much as a lot of people. And I did make it. I did make a couple of YouTube videos about it. You, right? So Paul Eisner did remind us that there is uh, detail of, in the BMFA rulebook about making the lines up. It it, it says how long the loop's got to be what radius the loop's got to be how long the binding is and then how long the cotton epoxy binding is yeah that's exactly right yeah so, so, so just quickly about learning to fly in the pylon so the first thing is you have to make sure that the pylon top is at a suitable height for you now, generally speaking, the U of the pylon 
sits right here on your chest, I see, right on your chest. Um, and we're talking here about flying a two-line model, not talking about flying monoline at all. We're just talking about flying two lines. So generally speaking, the handle is most comfortable around about the chest side. So you set your you set your you there and, and there's a reason for that and it's because you, you want to be able to get the handle into the u without really looking at it because subconsciously if you just imagine you're running around with the model flying and you're holding it let's say you're right-handed in your right hand and you're holding the pylon in the left hand the the temptation is as you come around to go into the pile on you look down at the pile on and as soon as you look down at the U, you you will give a little bit of down to the model and yes you'll get your hand in the pile on but the model will hit the concrete so you, you want to get it in a position so that as you come around you you can watch the model and get that get that handle into the pile on without really looking at the pile on so to do that, you need to know where the pylon is when you take off. So I generally, because I'm right-handed, will have the pylon on my right-hand side. I'll probably be about a yard away from it. And there's several advantages to that. When the model's released, if it's, if it's a prop-driven model of some size with some torque, it's likely come slightly towards you because of the propeller torque. And you need to be able to step back, to keep the line tension on until the model's flying fast enough that, that the tension is held on and you can get it out of the pylon. So as you come around, you know where the pylon is. And as you come around, you're able to grasp the head of the pylon with your left hand. And then you go around and as you go around again, then you're ready to enter the pylon. I mean, it's, it's, hard to, it's harder to explain than it is to do, but you do need to practice it a bit. Um, and Joe, I've seen you, I, I know you can do it, but, uh, but you're, you're right to remind us that, you know, learning to fly in the pylon is one of the keys to learning to fly speed. So um, we, we did do this ages ago and I did, I did do a couple of YouTube videos about that, and you can see, see a fat old bloke demonstrate it for you. There, uh, I don't know. Did we put the links on the on the website for those? Yeah, people? those links are up on the website. I think yeah, they are. Yeah, I think they are. So that's 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 flying in the pylon. Thanks for the reminder, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just looking through um, the, the questions. There's quite a lot of questions on about the the single bladed and two bladed again. Um, you know, some of the questions are about, you know, why fly one, why fly two? I mean, you've obviously mentioned Peter's, Pete Hellman's comments about uh, breaking props. Um, what What is the best prop, I guess? Single, single blade. I'm, I'm not really the best guy to talk about it, but I mean, for example, Barry flies uh, international class pylon and they fly two blade propellers. Yes, but that, that's Wait, because they man, it was mandated out in the rules. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, single bladed so, is definitely yeah. the best way to to go. We would be flying single blade propellers in, in RC pylon if it wasn't. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I believe that's because a single bladed propeller is a bit more efficient in that it doesn't have to cope with the backwash from the other blade. Is that right? Yeah, and you, I, I think you get a bit, you get a bigger prop arc as well. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. The there was some attempt in pylon racing. Actually, an English guy used a very stumpy blade on one side and a full blade on the other. But now the rules say that the blades have got to be equal length. Right. So there's there's clearly an advantage to a single yeah. blade propeller over and above not breaking them quite so much. Uh, Mark, at some stage, Wakefields and rubber models used single bladed propellers, didn't they? Yeah, they they did, and um, my my knowledge going back is is slightly limited on this, but I I think it was primarily to do with the balance of the, the balance of the propeller itself, 
Um, but I, I say I would need to do quite a bit of research in that. We, we haven't seen a single bloody propeller on a Wakefield for an awful long time. No. It's, uh... Martin Radcliffe has just pointed out as well, you, you, you'll only get the vortex drag off of one tip rather than off of two tips with a... So, yeah, so generally speaking, if you go to go to all the faff of running a single blade, you, you, you should be running more efficiently. So, you know, at the end of the day, sounds like single blade propellers will give you a bit more thrust. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Paul said only one blade to shape and finish. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. Else, any more questions? We've got a bit longer. I think yeah, we probably I'd like to say something about flying speed, to, to, particularly to anyone who's thinking about coming in. There's something for everyone um, in, in control or in speed flying. It doesn't matter whether, you, you know, whether you're pretty poor, you can still build a model and get an engine on off of eBay and get flying. Um, if you can't fly, for whatever reason, disability, not confident, you can get someone to fly the model for you. Um, so there's something for everyone at a control line speed meeting. If you're interested in fast models, there's something there for, for, for all people. And that's pretty important to, um, to point out, Dick. I think that's right. And, and also, we seem to have a fairly good camaraderie going for us. And, and I mean, I say that I've flown in the US and I've flown here and speed flyers seem to be pretty much the same. They're a great bunch and they, everybody helps each other. So if you come along and want to fly, you know, or learn to fly or anything like that, there's no shortage of help. There's no shortage of help. And I mean, even at the international class, I mean, thinking back to when Matthew, my son Matthew was asked to join the the, or, or at least um, fly F2A as a junior so that he could um, fly enough competitions to be eligible to join the, the speed team. You know, he was given lots of encouragement. They worked him hard. I have to say they worked him hard. But, uh, you know, there was no shortage of encouragement and... Um, it, it, it's just the same right the way across, right the way across the whole, the whole spectrum of speed flying. I mean, you know, it's it's a niche, no doubt about it, and we kind of do our best to make parts for people and all the rest of it, with sometimes more successfully than others. But generally, everybody has a good time that flies, and uh, you know. Seeing somebody on the end of a sport jet and the smile on their face when the when they come out of the circle for the first time is something to behold. You know, I remember Ollie Witt's smile the first time he he actually made yeah. a successful flight. You know, it, we, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. We've got a question here from John Leggett. Does the pylon take the full load of the model when it's up to speed? Yes. There's three different ways that uh, you can you can fly monoline, conventional, two line, open speed, or the F two A style um, pylon, where you actually have to have a bar across the handle. So in the case of the F two A handle, and you can also use that in any open speed, the pylon does take the the strain. In a conventional open speed where you're putting your wrist into the U, it doesn't actually take any of the pylon, doesn't actually take any of the strain. But there's an incredible feeling of um, reassurance when you get into the pylon. It doesn't feel like you're um, holding the model, a, a, bit, a big heavy model, out of the pylon. It, it, there's a great sort of feeling when you get into the pylon. It gives you a feeling of confidence um, and safety, um, but you are still taking all of the load. And in monoline, uh, particularly G 
jet monoline once you get on to the um what you you're holding the pylon when you start and you are taking um the, the strain on the pylon uh, there's a kind of a hook that goes around the uh, yoke uh, called granny hook um to so that the, 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 the monoline jet models are the pylons taking the strain, but an IC model you have to start out of the pylon because you've got to help it off of the help it off of the ground. The jet's just got so much pull off the line um, that, that they've got line tension within a few feet. Yeah, but uh, well, so we, I mean, we generally we use on the fast jet, but still, we're kind of off topic here a bit. But generally. Most, no, most normal people will use a granny hook and start in the pylon with a fast jet. If you're built the same way as Joey Matheson and a few others, you don't need to do that. You, you can start out of the pylon and you can go into the pylon just the same as you would with any other monoline model. Uh, but all of that said, the question was, will the pylon take the full weight? And the answer is, yes, it will. They are very securely attached to the ground uh, so that you can do that. And uh, I mean, Joey weighs 360 pounds. So when he's swinging around the pylon, it has to be pretty stout. Just guys, for the um, initiated like myself, who's only done a little bit of mini Goodyear racing once or twice in my in, back in the day, what sort of pull are we talking about? Give, give us an example, because I have no idea what sort of force you're talking about. We're we talking about a sack of potatoes going round, or no idea. Well, not not a big sack of potatoes. So I mean, a sport jet, I don't know, what, about thirty to forty pounds, maybe, right. maybe. Um, a fast jet, well, it'll pull a lot more. And Martin Radcliffe has said quite a lot about. To pull on a on an open sixty model, you know it it's probably in excess of eighty pounds. Wow! So you have to you have to latch onto the pylon strongly, you know, fairly quickly. Uh, but for for most of the models that we're talking about, you know, the the most pull would be on a sport jet, thirty to forty pounds, just maybe. You know, and all the other models are a lot less than that. Oh, thank you. No, it's good. I mean, the fast F two A model. Yeah, you asked Paul Eisner. I mean, they... well, Paul's just Paul's just said three hundred kilometers. It's pulling fifty pound an F two A model. There you go. Yeah, that's that, that that's a that's as good an answer as you're going to get on that. I have to say, a sport jet when you're flying it out of the pylon, it feels like a sack of spuds. <laughs> <laughs> it's not far <laughs> off. <laughs> no, it's not far off. No, it it feels like fifty pounds to me. Yeah. No, that's that that's quite surprising. But it was the way you were describing it. Then I just thought, hang on a minute, this is quite a lot more force than because when you watch, when I've watched at the nationals, it doesn't come across like that because you guys are so in control of what you're doing. You don't get that impression of any any of the real pull there, you know. And um, no. good. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're nearly through the questions, I think. I think you've answered most of those barriers well. Was there any others you wanted to pick up on? Or? Yes, um, no, a, I... there is one more issue that Barry and I spoke about today that we wanted yes. to talk about. Barry, you can lead off on this because it was your idea. Okay, so we are quite keen to have a training session probably at Buckminster early next year. That I mean, for people who don't know, one of the things is there's a time, the timing is all done automatically um, by a system called Transi Trace. And we could do with getting a few more people trained on how to use that, that would make the, particularly the meetings um, with a decent entry a little bit easier to run. And we could do that at Buckminster with some smaller IC models. Um, Maybe we could even use a um, Texas Quickie Rat or something like that uh, for doing that. And it would also be an opportunity to share some ideas and get some some of the new guys flying with their 21N models. Um, get so, some pylon practice. 
Yeah, pylon practice. You know, people have talked about that. John Leggett talked about it um, earlier, uh, about getting into the pylon. I mean, it was one of my big worries was getting into the pylon. But then suddenly one day it just became, I realised that I wasn't hanging on to the pylon um, when I took off. And I just automatically found it. It suddenly clicked. Um that, that I could find the pylon. Um, so, yeah, pylon practice, um, checking over models, and also transi trace training. Um, if anyone's interested in that, I, I think there'd be a lot of merit in it. If we could get probably 10 or 12 people, that would be worthwhile. Sounds, sounds like a good idea, that. Yeah, yeah so, I, I mean, we're quite in, we're quite uh, interested to find out whether everybody else thinks it's a good idea as well. Um, yeah, because if so, how many people have we still got? And we still well, what, what we what we can what we can do, Barry? We can stop. We can thank everybody and stop everything, and we can invite some people into the room and see what they want to say. Let's do it that way round. Okay. Um, yeah, before we do that, just want to just want to thank Dick and Barry for a, a fabulous evening again. Um, incredibly informative, lots of lots of positive comments in the chat box on that as well. Um, and just to remind everybody as well that next week and I think the week after, we're, we're not running a session just to give everybody a break for Christmas and to get over the turkey and port. Um, so just everybody have a wonderful Christmas and Happy New Year. We're going to stop the recording now and um, we'll invite anybody in who wants to come in to have a <coughs> chat with the guys.